I am thrilled to be talking to Elizabeth Gilbert right now. Um, you all know her as a journalist, her novelist. Uh, she wrote Eat, Pray, Love famously. But your newest book out now is City of Girls, which um, people can order on Amazon, I'm sure. I'm talking to you today because you are so good at giving voice to collective experiences. And I wonder if you could speak to us a little bit about how you make sense of the moment we're living through right now. Oh, <laughs> good softball question. I know, sorry. <laughs> I could start narrowly if you want. No pressure, no pressure. Um, how do I make sense of the moment that we're living in? I am actually not trying to make sense of it. Um, because I think that at this point in my life, I, I recognize when things are happening that are beyond my control, um, bigger than me, and far past the limits of my power. And this looks like all of those things. Um, on, on the biggest scale, probably, that I've ever personally witnessed it. Um, and so that, to me, is a signal to just allow it to happen. <laughs> and I know that that might sound passive, but I think there's a slight difference between a sense of sanity producing surrender and um, quitting or a kind of deep passivity. So for me, I am I think it's way too soon. I feel like the, the pandemic hasn't even shown us yet everything that it intends to do with us and the way that it's having with us. Um, we're just a couple months into it, and this may be a multi-year event. Um, and so the humility that life has been teaching me by constantly showing me where I'm past the limits of my power compels me to just say, I don't know what this thing is yet. <laughs> um, I don't know what this thing is yet, and I would never have the hubris to to start to suppose why it's happening. I hear a lot of people throwing out a lot of theories, whether they're conspiracy theories or environmental theories or political theories um, or spiritual theories about why this is happening. And I feel like that's way above all of our pay grades. And I actually see a tremendous amount of sanity out there. Um, I see sanity in the form of people doing all they can to help one another. And I don't think that there's a greater definition of sanity than that. So to me, it doesn't feel like insanity. And also when people speak about it as being a war, it doesn't feel like a war. A war is where people go out of their ways to injure and kill each other. This is precisely the opposite of that. Um, this is a situation where all of humanity is joined together to try to minimize the damage of this as much as possible and help each other in any way that they can, with a few exceptions, but very few. Um, so I'm, I'm humbly watching it um, and, and trying to avoid drawing conclusions and then trying to see where can I be of assistance within the limits of my power. Um, because I know that every time I reach out of the limits of my power, I will suffer, but only every time. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so I'm aware of my, I'm aware of my limitations. Um, life has taught me that. A lot of the anxiety I hear people express is fundamentally about discomfort with uncertainty. Re apart from the specifics, it's just the not knowing. Do you have any tools or wisdom or practical advice that you've drawn on for making decisions and feeling generative and creative in the face of uncertainty? Well, um, the uncertainty, the way I feel about it is, is the uncertainty has always been what our futures are. We just know, are really noticing it right now. <laughs> and we're so good with our tricks and our toys that we've created all sorts of ways that we don't have to experience uncertainty because we hate it. As a species, we hate it. And I would say that as contemporary Western cultured Americans, we hate it more than anybody's ever hated it. And, um, and we've run away from uncertainty in every possible way that we can. So one of the things that's happening right now is that this big, it's like this big truth bomb is occurring um, that's just letting you know, hey, you're not actually in control. The paradox for me in my life, the paradox of surrender is that it can be very relaxing. <laughs> um, it's And it's the last thing any of us want to do. It's the last thing any of us want to do is say, I am not in control. There is no certainty. Tomorrow is not promised to anybody. It's Those are seem to be the most frightening words that anybody could ever say. And yet when you say them and you accept them, there's this, I find in my life, there's this deep constitutional peace that comes over me in that moment because it's like, oh, I'm, I can put down my weapons now. 
um, and see what happens. I would also suggest an exercise if you want something very concrete. My friend Martha Beck teaches this exercise to people and it, and it has really beautiful results. Um, if you're feeling a tremendous amount of fear, sit down and invite your fear to write down everything that it's afraid of and don't judge it and don't try to fix it and don't try to control it and don't try to shame it. Just listen to your fear speak with non-compassionate with like kindness. So just say to your fear, I love you and I want to hear what you have to say and I respect you because fear demands to be respected. I respect you. Let me know what you're going through. And then your fear gets it, <clears throat> excuse me, your fear gets a chance to speak. Once it's done and it's gotten it all out, then you say to the fear, thank you so much for sharing that with me. And I appreciate you letting me know what you're going through and what you're feeling. And now I'm wondering if you could do me the favor of stepping aside now that you've been heard. And I'm going to ask another part of myself to step forward and speak. And that is my wisdom. And then you ask your wisdom to answer fear and to write down what it would say to the fear. And you will be astonished by the level of wisdom that you possess if you just give it a chance to speak. So when you were saying to me, do I have any wisdom? Maybe, but what I'm more interested in is that you actually do. <laughs> You've absorbed a tremendous amount of wisdom in your life, and this is the time to, to draw on it. For people who have never tried automatic writing, have never tried to speak from an inner wisdom, what would you say to them if they're watching this and they want to try it and they feel stifled? How do you go? How would I suggest that you do it? I would say that you personify it. So instead of thinking of wisdom as um, some abstract idea, right? Um, give it a face. Um, you can use Mandela. You can use Gandhi. You can use some relative that's passed away who you loved who had a sort of kind groundedness to them. So the exercise is if that person was in the room, the wisest, calmest, most reassuring, steady person in the entire world, if they were in the room, what would they say to you? And you'll be, you'll be able to reach it easier than you think um, because you've been paying more attention than you think to that kind of stuff. And the same with your fear. Give it a, give it a face. Give it a, you know, my, my fear is always um, about four years old. Um, it's, it's, I've got pictures of myself. As, I was a very anxious child. I can see that little kid sitting on the beach, watching people in the waves and getting really frightened of the ocean and asking her mother to please go and make everybody get out of the ocean because it was making her anxious. Like that's my inner fear. And she hasn't changed since she's four years old. So when I allow her to speak, she'll tell me everything that she's terrified of. And then when I speak to her from a voice of wisdom, I can usually calm her down um, by coming to her from an older part of myself. Could you speak for a moment about this notion of collective grief and what you think we might be experiencing as a culture in that regard? I know a lot about personal grief. Um, and I think collective grief is the same, just larger and more of it. Um, what I've learned about grief through the loss of my partner, Rhea, the love of my life, who died two years ago, was the most humbling experience of my entire life. And I, again, I'm going to go back to, I'm going to continue to use words that have to do with surrender. And, and again, I'm going to know that I'm going to run into resistance because we are a culture that doesn't want to do that. And my experience with it was when I learned that it's a natural process, it's happening to me, it's coming from a bigger source than anything that I can manage. And if I can relax and let it break over me like a wave and let it take me, what I learned is that it has a relatively short lifespan if you let it do its, its impact with the greatest immediacy. Where you're going to suffer is if you're pushing back against it, refusing to allow yourself to feel it. And so there's a, a, there's a sense I had of just, I felt like when my big grief waves would come, and they still come sometimes, but when the big ones would come, I would feel like, okay, I've got about an 18 second warning. <laughs> It's like an 18 second warning before an earthquake hits. And my friend who does a lot of somatic body work taught me literally get down on the ground, like literally get down on the ground. This is a bow down moment. Grief. I, I've come. My personification of grief is that it is a mighty God, you know, and it's going to come and it's going to give you its full impact. And so I will get on my knees and put my head down and just be like, okay, here it comes. And then let it, you know, and that comes with sobbing, shaking, 
you have no idea how important it is to shake physically, how much trauma you can get out of your body by allowing it to do its full earthquake on you. And if you don't resist at all, and you completely surrender to it, and every part of you is going to be like, no, 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 I can't. You can. You actually can. Let it have you. It doesn't, it can't actually last for more than about 20 minutes at the most. There's a wave. It's almost like labor pains. There's a, there's a series of waves that are going to come and then they're going to stop. And if you know that, then you can ride it. And then you'll find yourself and you're wrung out and you're exhausted and you're on the ground, but it's over. And then you can go get a sandwich. <laughs> <laughs> and to, and to be super concrete the- about it, that doesn't just have to apply if you've lost a loved one. If you've lost a job, if you've lost a sense of stability in your life and you're resisting the emotion and you live all day with this resistance. All of it. And the resistance is actually what's going to harm you, not the grief. Um, and and so it's, it's extraordinary because... Um, what generally happens is that you have this wave that you think you can't survive because we've been taught that those emotions are unsurvivable. So you let it have you, you let it do its thing with you, you let it roll over you like some thunderous piece of nature, which it is. And then you're left kind of like panting and exhausted, but you'll find that there's a release. Something has been released. And then when you stand up and go make yourself a sandwich and catch your breath, you'll find that your wisdom can now have a, a new space into which, into which to enter where you can now start to ask some practical and pragmatic questions. It's, it's actually quite miraculous. And is there a feeling of courage after you've gone through it? Like, I've allowed this to happen. I survived it. I can endure. There's a certain level of courage that has at its foundation a humility of knowing the, the limits and the, um, and the fullness of the human emotional experience and not being afraid to go all the way to the ends of it. I was feeling this last night. I was missing Rhea very hard last night. Her birthday was recently. This is my, my partner who died. And I felt myself, and I just felt myself saying, I just put my hands on my own chest and I felt myself saying, I want to have the courage to watch this without flinching. You know, I want to have the courage to watch what's happening to me emotionally right now without collapsing, without flinching. And I just breathed through it and it turned into something so fascinating. Just watching myself have this emotional reaction without looking away, without reaching for any of the tools and toys that we reach to in order to get out of ourselves. And I breathed through it, it took about 15 minutes and it moved through me. And I almost felt like she was present in that, helping me, showing me like, you can actually, you can actually be sober through your grief and you can be present through your grief and you can watch it the way you watch Florida weather come in and out, you know? Um, <laughs> and so I think, you know, this is a culture that has taught us erroneously that we can overcome anything, um, that we can defeat anything, that we can buy anything, that we can outsource anything, that we can fix anything. And this is a really humbling moment where a lot of us, a lot of people for the very first times are going to have to be right up against the limits of their powerlessness. It's going to be really interesting to see how people react. Do you have moments of happiness in the middle of quarantine where you just feel joy and delight? I, I have much more happiness than anything else. Um, I have to admit, I'm sorry, I just, I didn't come here to lie to you. Yeah. No. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm in a good moment in my life right now. Um, a lot of what I'm experiencing in quarantine, I've been preparing for it unknowingly for so much of my life because of the times in my life that I put myself into isolation on purpose. Um, and whether that was through daily meditation, which is a kind of quarantine, where you, you deliberately choose to withdraw from the world and put yourself into silence and see again, can I watch the, the doings of my mind and the doings of my emotion without flinching? Can I stay seated on this mat through this storm that's, that's passing through my mind right now? And can I watch it like the weather? And, and I've done so many years of that. You know, I, I went to an ashram in India for four months of it, 12 hours a day, sitting alone in a room. And I can tell you that for those of you who are not accustomed to being alone with yourself without distraction, what you are feeling right now is exactly what those first two and a half months in that ashram felt like to me. Incredible discomfort, incredible agitation, frustration, boredom anger, shame, rage, pain. That's what comes up when you take all the pacifiers out of your mouth <laughs> and when you take all the distractions away and when you get sent to your room to just sit in silence. But it's the most interesting thing you can possibly do with your life. And I don't mean that. And I, I can't say that. It's not an exaggeration. 
the most interesting thing that a human being can possibly do is to sit with her own self in her own silence and watch the weather of her own mind and learn how this thing operates. A lot of you did not sign up for this on purpose. I signed up for that on purpose. I paid money to go to meditation retreats <laughs> to be put into small rooms by myself alone because I wanted to see the full extent of the human experience. Those of you who didn't sign up for this on purpose and everything that I'm saying to you sounds like a nightmare, then I would suggest do all the things that you need to do to keep yourself comforted, to keep yourself connected to your friends, to do your Zoom parties, to like whatever it is that you need to do to not injure your psyche. Those of you who are listening to me and you're like, that sounds kind of interesting, I would just say to you, don't waste this moment. So I'm okay. And I have, I have, I have waves of pain for the suffering that other people are going through, but I also have learned enough to know that if you're suffering and I decide to suffer because you're suffering, now we have two people suffering and there's nobody who can help. And I want to remain a helper. And so that means I'm taking really good care of myself so that when people need help, I can be there for them. There are a lot of healthcare workers in this audience. And how can they employ this in the moment if they're working in ICUs, if they're just dealing with it every day? The message that I have for healthcare workers is that what you are facing right now was something that you were never intended to have to go through. And if you are struggling, that is the appropriate reaction to having to go through and see the amount of trauma that you are in. And if you are beating yourself up because you think you should be able to get through this without it getting to you, that's the piece that I hope that you will let go of because you're being challenged beyond what any normal human, what any human being can endure. Um, and it, for you people who are on the front lines of this war and on the front lines of this battle, it may be that you are in a moment of your life where the only mandate is that you have to survive it. Uh, you don't have to do it well. You don't have to do it gracefully. You don't have to do it with Zen. You don't have to do it with, with ease. You don't have to do it like some kind of a Buddhist monk. You just have to get through this. And once you're through this, then if there's hopefully some breathing room in your life, you can start to do the repair on what it's done to you, what it's done to your psyche, what it's done to your body. Um, but to expect that you should be able to pass through that in a state of total Zen is too much. It's too much to ask. So there's this disproportionate thing happening in culture right now where a massive burden is on the shoulders of very few people. And this is something that happens in life every once in a while in history. It happens in the lives of soldiers at times during wars, where the massive disproportionate amount of suffering is on the, the shoulders of a very few people. And it's happening right now in the medical community. And I just want to tell you that I love you and I see that that is happening. And my prayer is that it will end soon and that all of us will do our parts in order to stay away from each other in order to help it end soon and that then you will be able to get the rest that you need. But to expect that you should be able to handle this, and if you get waves of grief and waves of shutdown, let the grief hit you, not as soon as you can. <laughs> as soon as you can, and as soon as you can shake it out of your body. Um, there was a, a priest who was in the Vietnam War who has done, he came back from Vietnam and he did incredible research on PTSD. And one of the things that he found was that people who went through a traumatic, tremulous shaking of trauma were far less likely to have PTSD afterwards than people who were holding it together. Um, and so the soldiers who had been through the same sorts of things, if there were people who melted down, soldiers who melted down, shook, cried, sobbed, in other words, looked like cowards, those people actually did better later in life than the ones who were gripping and holding it together. So once again, is the lesson of the if you can let this thing take you when you when you have a moment, <laughs> you may actually get through it a little bit better. I have nothing but but reverence for what they're doing and gratitude. Thank you for sharing your time and for sharing what I think is your wisdom. Uh, Thank you so much. <laughs> and people can follow you, at, uh, of course, by your books and you're on Instagram at Elizabeth underscore Gilbert underscore writer. Yes? Yeah. Okay. And um, good luck, everybody. Um, you don't have to thrive through this, but you try to survive. <laughs> We're all doing our best. <laughs> we can do hard things. We can do hard things. Just do your best. <laughs> Thank you so Thank much. You. Thank you. Take good care. Take care. Bye.